I'm not no fucking firefighter, so I do not know how to put out the raging fire that is me. I don't know how long it would take or how much water is needed to cool me off. I don't have no fire extinguisher. Besides, even if I did, would I use it on myself? Plus, I can't figure out this dead shit. I'm used to being able to figure out any situation no matter how complicated it is. Now I'm thinking, since I'm dead, shouldn't my mind shut off? How come I could still know my own thoughts? After a while, I figured out that the angrier I get, the worse the impact is on me. The only reason I reached this conclusion is because I thought about how I never ever in my lifetime was that angry bitch. I never had a reason to be that. I was always calm and cool and cold and steady. Even when shit was fucked up, I knew how to flip shit in my favor. Even on lock, I flipped everything and everyone in my favor. If any chick was mad at me, even if it was for a good reason, the next step was for that bitch to get glad because I had a crew she couldn't resist. That crew started out with just me and believe it or not, became me and Simone. Yeah, the same Simone who cut my face with the jagged edge of a broken bottle, giving me the only scar I ever got in my young royal life that could only be concealed by my silky hair if I wore it loose, which on lock I could not do. I hated Simone for impacting my flawless face. She hated me too. But in prison, man, we were both better off using our mutual hatred together against others who probably hated us both more. So we did. We got on some Beauty and the Beast type shit, breaking bitches down. My look, still stellar even with the scar, made them want to serve me or join me. Simone's beasting made them have no other option. So they gave in and got glad and ganged up beneath us. But I don't want to think about Simone. I just did and it caused my heat to flare up about six notches. I was figuring out that when my heat peaks, I dissolve. When I dissolve, I disappear from whatever I was seeing, hearing, and feeling. But my thinking continues on. Who wants to be a glob of heat with thoughts trapped in an infinite black space? Not me. So I figured I had to lower my temperature by thinking of anything that could make me feel good. Feeling good would be the opposite of feeling bad and then my anger might go away and the feeling in my face, arms, hands, legs, feet, and even my toes would return. After Santiago, there is only midnight as far as real men in real life who I really know. Midnight still gives me that ooh ah good feeling. It's stronger and deeper than the spark a hot rapper or huge movie star or amazing baller could ever shoot through my pussy like lightning. Midnight is a man who makes all of my body parts pulsate, even when he is not doing anything but standing still. His effect lasts over time, no matter how much time passes. To the point where, even if I don't see him except in my mind, my whole body, including my heart, still feels the throbbing sensation. If you don't know what I mean, it means you never met him, never seen him, and you never ever even met any man like him, which is extremely possible. When men see women, they grade us. They be like, she's a five, six, seven, or eight. Ten represents the top bitch, which is rare for them to say. When men see even a glimpse of me, they automatically and naturally say ten, the highest. It's the reason they call me winter santiago a dime so why not grade them the men the same way now i'm entertaining myself and getting excited in a good way well let's see we will start at the bottom which obviously is the lowest the lowest type of man is a zero a dude who actually fucks his children or anybody else's little children a man who molests and rapes because he feels like a zero and knows he's a zero so he stalks little kids and women who he's pretty sure even his weak backward ass can overpower. Zero type slime balls like this also molests and abuses and rapes his girlfriend's children or his stepchildren who are not his biological kids. So sick is he, he even rapes his own or her own sons. I wouldn't say none of this greasy shit if I didn't know that it actually happened. Having been locked in with so many women coming from so many places across the country, I know it goes on. Don't misunderstand. I ain't all kid crazy. I think having babies is a burden that breaks the bitch down. Mostly, it fucks up her figure and lessens her value. 
Same way a new whip is worth major paper. Soon as you buy it and drive it off the car lot, it's worth a lot less. It's used. With babies, once you have one, all of a sudden you have two and then three. Then the only thing you have more than babies is problems. A bitch used to have the luxury of being all about herself. Even from the first baby, everything becomes all about the kid. Instead of going for manicures and makeovers, she's left wiping up piss and cleaning up poo. Washing diapers and dishes and your whole pizzazz is stolen and gone. Unless you got paper pals, forget having babies. Better to have the cheese to pay the servants to do all of the dirty work while you style. That's the only way kids are all good with me. Still, I don't respect no nigga who hurts, rapes, or molests the children. Even if he got money stacks and status, he's a zero nigga to me. Men who are the next lowest type are the ones who are straight cowards. I don't know what happens to cause so many men to fit this description. I do know that a coward can never get a bitch like me hot and probably not you either. A lot of chicks on lock, when we got into talking about their men, had cowards. These guys were the ones that blamed everybody else for their circumstance. Especially they blamed their woman or their women. Most of the females I met who had gotten beat up bad by men were the ones messing with some coward who they were supporting and providing for and whose dick they were sucking. He'd take her money, go get drunk with it, and come back and beat her ass because he spent it all. Didn't have no hustle, business, or a job, or any way to save face for his failures. So he used her as a punching bag. Some niggas who got jobs or a business they own is also cowards. But instead of them being rated as a lowly one, they would be a two or a three because at least they work. These types might beat up their woman or women or might not. But they are also still cowards in other ways. They the type that fuck a bunch of chicks but not discreetly. They purposely leave clues that they fucking around randomly just to set these bitches to battling one another instead of all of the bitches linking up and catching him in his lying bullshit. Some of the females I was locked with been fighting some cowards of the broad for a whole decade. These bitches be baby battling instead of thinking. They be competing to give this coward a baby first. Then the next bitch gives him one soon after. The first one thinks she's better because she gave him one first. The second one thinks she's better because she's younger than the first one. On top of that, she feels more relevant because now she has his baby too. Next thing you know, both of them got three or four kids from this fool who is still broke, still beats their ass and spends their money from their nine to five or even their social service check. Meanwhile, he recruits a bitch three and a bitch four who are running around talking greasy about his baby's mamas. Because now they old news and number three and four don't nag and sweat him because they the new pussy he's poking. He's spending one and two's money on three and four. And besides, three and four both ain't pregnant yet. A man in the four to six range definitely got to have a business or a job. But he also, to earn those numbers four through six, got to have a decent look. Some niggas stay stuck at number four because their style, ways, and look is limp and lame. If you need your teeth fixed, drag your ass to the dentist. Bad breath, funky armpits, pus-filled pimples, dirty, rotten, cheesy dick, shit-stained boxers or drawers, and toe jam are all disqualifiers. Don't have long nails either, especially not with last night's dinner trapped underneath them. Never ever wear cheap soil kicks, cheap or mismatched socks, or run over shoes, even if you gotta eat out less. The kicks and shoes are way more important than a bucket of chicken or shrimp fried rice or even lobsters. Sacrifice, you idiot. When I started laughing, it felt like my temperature lowered. About 12 notches. For a man to be a 7 or 8, he has to have a hustle, a business, or a job and not beat his woman up ever. I'm not counting play fighting. I like sex to be a little rough sometimes and always very physical. I like to look at a man's body first because I get wet by the design of something stunning. I don't mind a few scratches during the love making long as there is no passion marks on my face. I like makeup sex after we had a little argument. I might even cause a little argument to get that passionate thrust going on. But brutalizing is bullshit. I met several females on lock who agree. 
They murdered a man or two for laying into them repeatedly like they were professional fighters. These women would arrive at the joint black and blue in the face and permanent scars were all over their bodies when their uniforms dropped. For the seven and eight rated men who do what a man is supposed to do but keep a bitch on a bullshit budget, even though he's caked up, that's why he's stuck in the seven eight range. Or the type of guy who over monitors his woman, doesn't buy her a car or hire her a driver and don't give her taxi money and space to be a woman so she can get herself right. Get her look perfect so she can enslave him in the bedroom, which whether he knows it or not is what he really wants. I'm cracking up now. I'm feeling my toes tingle and my calves and my knees are no longer numb. Nine is next to perfect, but not quite. A man who is a nine definitely owns his own business or is CEO of someone else's business. The key is his endeavor, whatever it may be, has got to be profitable. A seven or eight can have a business, but it's one thing to have a business by name only, but no dividends. That's why there are sevens and eights that have mastered fronting and even done a great job at it. They have a business, but the small profit they earn is spent on what they are wearing on their backs what whips they are leasing, and the apartments, condos, or houses they are renting, but can't keep because they don't own. They make it all look good, but after the look, there is no equity, assets, or cheddar left over. Nine distinguishes the man who's big banking, legit and illegit, with corporate credit and corporate cash, personal cash and personal savings, and a slush fund, as well as a stacked up hood stash from all of the lowered numbered men beneath him. Meaning a nine, in addition to his legit capital, has got to also have a dirty money pal in his backyard or in a super secret, can't be discovered place, stitched into his furniture, built into his wall, buried beneath his pool, floating in his yacht, or stuffed in his mama's attic in the house he bought her. To be a nine, he got to be all that, as well as neat and clean and fashionable and manly. He can have any size dick because his status makes chicks overlook it and come with creative ways to get the sex and keep the sex exciting. Ten is Santiago and Midnight, the only men who are perfect to me. Stupid ass Simone was talking about how Midnight didn't show up for me on my release day like I said he would. But she didn't know what really happened. I'm action. Simone's after the action. She always been an after the action bitch. She waits for somebody else to build up their business and she robs their shit that they built. That's why she's after the action to me. When we was locked, our little crew was organizing in the day room what business we were going to run once we got released. I, of course, was plotting a fashion empire. I would design the clothes because I'm nice with it. Then I'd employ a bunch of chicks who was nice with the needle to sew. A lot of locked up women were working in a sewing factory on the inside. They was nice with regular needle and thread sewing. Plus, they knew how to work the sewing machinery. I was not only going to be a clothing designer, merchandiser, wholesaler, and retailer. I planned to get into interior decoration. I figured no matter what anybody wore or possessed or imagined, I could make it look even better. I would set up the most meanest looking images and make the whole hood and whole world chase it. Of course, that means more money, more money for me. Seated in the crooked circle, Simone was cheering my ideas on. Then she was like, Winter, that's the perfect setup. You look pretty and lure the clients with that interior decorating shit. I'll lay low for a month or so after your work is done. Then, surprise motherfuckers, it's a stick up. Get butt naked. Keep your hands where I can see them. Don't make me check your orifices. If you're hiding diamonds in your asshole, shit them out while I'm asking you nicely. Simone dramatized and we cracked up. I robbed the whole crib, whoever's home, even the bitch from next door who just stopped by to drop off a blueberry pie. I'm swiping everything that Winter convinced them to buy. Their appliances, merchandise, cars, jewels, cash, credit cards, and even their dogs. Rich motherfuckers will pay high ransom just to get back one kidnapped dog. They'll pay even more than they would for one of their kids. If not, I heard the black market for pets be bubbling. Simone laughed. So did the rest of us. But in my mind, I knew she could never come up with a good business idea other than stealing. That shit must have been in her bloodline. That's why she's an after-the-action bitch. 
Oh no, my thighs are numbing. I wasn't supposed to think about Simone. I didn't want to get heated all over again. Anyway, back to midnight. When Elisha came up a week after we discussed on the phone that there was one thing I needed him to take care of that I needed to say face to face, he gave me a full report on the status of my reality star demands. He said wardrobe was a 100% go and even threw in a diamond necklace like a real motherfucking G. The VIP passes, liquor, parties, and perks was all a go. He got the warden and the city working on the permits and licensing to do the film shoot, and they were excited because nothing good really happens up there where I was in lockup territory. Plus, I think they was just on Elisha's balls and would give him anything he wanted for a close-up or selfie to brag about after he and his film crew packed up and left their little prison city flipped back to dreary gray. Porsche had asked Midnight to promise that he would show up on your prison release date. She asked him way back right after she came up here to check you. Midnight agreed. He's a word is bond type of brother. Elisha said, speaking discreetly to me as every prisoner is always monitored, even in visitation. But when I followed up with him this week and told him about the reality show, he said, no cameras. I started to try to convince him, but he's not the type who can be convinced once he has made a decision. So I stopped myself from asking again, Elisha explained. But Porsche could not be stopped. She called Midnight and said, you promised, and a promise is a promise. Midnight told your sister, I never promised to be a character in the show. That was never part of our agreement. I was disappointed. For some seconds, I didn't say anything back to Elisha. I was thinking of ways to flip it in my favor, like how little smart-ass kids used to try and maneuver that Rubik's Cube when it was hot. If you succeed with getting my special request done, I will still do the reality show, I finally said to Elisha. Without Midnight, his black Bentley, and the red carpet? Elisha double-checked. I hesitated and then said, yes, without him. But I still want a badass black Bentley and the royal red carpet. After I walk the carpet, I'll let my girls get in the whip with me. So make that six crystal flute champagne glasses. Cool. I'm surprised you let it go that easily, Elisha said. Midnight is not the only cool one. I'm a word is bun kind of bitch. I already gave my word and my loyalty to you that if you handle my special request, I'll do the show. So that's our agreement. I'm waiting to see if you can honor that. True. I didn't ever explain the details of the situation to my girls about the trade-off I had to make. I did not feel like I owed any one of them a damn thing, not even an explanation. That night in my cell during Lights Out, it dawned on me that this was the reason I was spun out over midnight whipped and fixed and maybe even a little obsessed. He was the only man in my whole wide world who I wanted with my whole heart, who I put in my full effort for, who I showed my whole self and even revealed my bare body to, who I could not draw to me. I just couldn't move him. He was the only man who nothing anybody said mattered to him. He was so solid, his mind so made up that no one could move him unless he had already planned to move. Besides the power that moved within him, he could not be forced. It caused everyone who ever seen him to want him even more. Even my girls, although none of them would ever admit it, felt it, saw it, wanted a taste or touch, or to really have him all to themselves. But they knew from when he first walked through our Brooklyn block with Santiago, he was not a man within their reach, not within their capability, not a dick they could pull, suck or just hop on and have a whole body, every part in a state of involuntarily continuous, overwhelming orgasm. Now I could feel the frenzy in my pussy after not having felt it in a very long, long time. It was throbbing. That's the type of heat that moved with midnight. Just the mention or thought of him could even arouse a dead bitch. My breasts were hot and my chest was heaving, my nipples erect. I was dolo in the dark and just about to come, so moved by his image in my memory that it made my whole body quake. Suddenly, I felt a shot through my chest and I was being pulled. I'm a dead bitch back on the move again. I'm fast forwarding through the dark. It felt so good, from orgasm to feeling high. 
This was a higher type of high, though. The difference similar to, on the one hand, smoking straight weed, and on the other hand, smoking weed with cocaine sprinkles on it. I was never a cokehead, but hey, when you drink or smoke with friends or lovers, you never know if they spike the Kool-Aid or punch or put sprinkles on your weed. Now, this cocaine blunt feeling had me enjoying the mysterious ride and feeling even lighter than a feather. When the action stopped, I floated down softly and landed in what felt like grass. I wasn't certain, though. I couldn't see nothing. Then, flat out. Bright, blinding sunlight. I threw my hands over my eyes and took only short peaks until they adjusted to the shocking shine. While my eyes were still covered, I could smell a certain unrecognizable scent. I eased open my fingers. I was standing in a field of flowers, all of them green-stemmed, tall, and yellow-faced. Hold up now. I'm a city bitch. So I'm like, what the fuck? Where am I and why am I here? I dropped my hands. I could see everything clearly. There were blue-headed, red, iridescent, feathered birds with long, curved beaks soaring above me. There were also uniquely orange-colored birds with straight, long beaks and a crown of feathers on the top of their heads. They were flying around the field, some landing in the trees, trees that looked like a memory that I didn't want to remember right now. It was from my 18 years young trip to the Florida Keys. Yes, palm trees, but these had sacks of strange fruit hanging from them that were not Florida coconuts. There were exotic butterflies fluttering up way too close to me. Some were several shades of orange only. Some of them were polka dotted and multicolored and in all types of unexplainable shapes. I started laughing. I'm used to pigeons and moths and mosquitoes and cement and sidewalks and gravel. In the far distance, there was a tall, wide, and long white wall that somehow glistened as though it had been covered with diamond dust, causing the shine from it and the power of the sun to collide and my eyes to squint. I never saw a wall like that. Someone had to be hiding something behind it, I thought. Looked like money to me, so I began walking in that direction. As soon as I did, I stopped short. I got psyched that I have legs and can subtly fully feel them. In fact, I can walk, see, hear, smell, and even taste the air. Ah, shit, air. That means I can breathe. I'm alive. After I walked through what felt like forever, I realized that fast-forwarding through darkness was a swifter mode of transportation. Walking for me now was somehow played out, a thing of the past, a tiring non-necessity. Finally reaching the white wall that had sparkled from afar, I could see the detailing of it. It was about 50,000 square feet long. It was solid as though made from huge, shiny white rocks. And every 10 feet, there was a parallel indentation perfectly carved into the wall. I walked to one of them and turned and stepped inside of the indentation. It was as though someone had carved out a space for a six or seven foot person to just stand outside but inside the wall. Crazy. I'm thinking, why would a man be standing inside of a solid rock wall? I stepped out from it and counted 21 indentations before I couldn't count any further because... That was how long the wall ran. Then I thought, maybe armed guards stay tucked in there. This wall must be protecting a mansion and each security guy stood in each indentation. But what type of hustler needed 50 security dudes outside of his crib? Maybe they were not even regular security, I suddenly thought. Maybe they were spaces for soldiers who carried M16s. Yo, maybe this was Pablo Escobar's joint or a Tony Montana or El Chapo or... I laughed, excited as I now walked alongside the wall, looking for the entrance. Sterling silver. That's what the incredibly sturdy, solid, wide door that was embedded inside of the white wall was made of. I stepped back to fully check it out. I looked up. On top of the wall sat white doves. They stared at me but didn't fly off all nervously like how birds tend to do when even being looked at by human beings. I took a good look at them and walked towards that badass door. I was glad that I don't have that bird fear that one of the chicks on lockup had. She would have been terrified if she was here. 
When I reached for the heavy metal knocker, my arm went right through the door as though it was not solid sterling silver, even though I am 100 that it is. My body followed. Once inside, I was still outside, meaning I looked up and I could still see the sky, not a ceiling or a roof. I was standing in what seemed to be the front yard. Beneath the beautiful trees were seven sterling silver outdoor chair and table sets with designer cushions and two sterling silver benches. Beyond the trees at the center of the yard was a huge multiple level fountain that seemed to be made of the same rock that the wall surrounding the house was made of. In addition to its sparkling, it was gushing water that looked clean enough to drink or bathe in. I walked towards it. I inhaled to see if it smelled any particular way. Clean water, I thought, should not have any smell whatsoever. I leaned in and stuck my hand in the flow. But when I drew my hand back, there was no water or trace of wetness in my palm. I thought about it. I'm not even thirsty or hungry. I had not seen food since prison breakfast this morning, which I didn't eat because it was my release day and I was going to be eating way better food from then on. But hold up. That could not have been this morning. I was released into a winter storm in the winter season. Where I am standing right now, it is obviously summer, not even spring. It has to be August, the hottest month. I can feel the hot breeze and everything is fully blossomed. I grabbed myself. What am I wearing? It better not be the white three-quarter hooded mink coat and the thigh-high boots. It isn't. I am wearing the I'm Rich Bitch Chanel winter white brocade tapered sleeveless mini with the pleats that gently hug my hips. Of course I am. I had ordered the mini to rock beneath the mean mink and to highlight the red python boots. Wait a minute. The red boots are gone. Now I'm not wearing no shoes. No shoes? Uh-uh. I walked around to the back side of the fountain. About 72 feet away was another door, which looked like it was made of pure platinum. Super wealthy. I get it. Dripping with dough. Caked up. Nothing but cheddar guap to the ceiling, raining paper. Overwhelmed, I didn't bother knocking, just breezed through which I now know I can do. I'm thinking, if I look around, I could find a pair of shoes and make them fit. I'm not worried about them being cheap or worn shoes. Evidently, I am in a wealthy place. No wealthy bitch would have a cheap shoe collection. Furthermore, every wealthy bitch would and should own tens, if not hundreds of shoes that have never been worn yet. I'm not gonna be caught dead and barefoot in someone else's mansion. I started laughing, but then stopped real quick remembering how my laughter just might start doubling, tripling, and mutating. This is not a mansion. It's a palace. Has to be. It has the highest ceiling that isn't a ceiling. It's a dome. The design of the dome is so dope, I want to fuck the architect just to congratulate him on doing what I plan to do in my fashion and decorating business. Design some shit that no one else had, that no one else has ever seen that mostly no one could ever afford except my clients. My clients who needed to be filthy to afford my commission. The sunlight poured through the dome's platinum framed glass skylights. It lit up the wide, long space making for nice shading. Some spaces had natural spotlights from the sun. Other spaces had shade. Why weren't there separate rooms separated by walls though? Why wasn't there any furniture? Instead, there were intricately woven carpets. Must have taken 400 weavers to inlay the designs. It was open space, no bedrooms or kitchen. But there were sinks on both the left and right, front and back sides of the building. It's a high-end nightclub. No, a ballroom, I thought. Then I canceled the thought right away. People can dance freely on carpeted floors. No owner or boss would want liquor spilling on hand-woven rugs. And I didn't even see no Hermes flats, slippers, or shoes, so I walked right out of the back of the palace. Crossing another yard, I reached a black wooden door. It was not just any door. It was made from ebony, and the grain was not anything that would be sold at anyone's local furniture store or supermarket or Home Depot. It had inlaid hand-carved design. I could tell from the way there was no knob or outward handle that it slid open instead of swinging in or out. I didn't slide or swing it, just walk through the solid wood, same as I had walked through the solid platinum and the solid sterling silver. 
a premium gymnasium like a private Madison Square Garden for some boss that obviously decided to have everything on his property that most had to leave their little apartments and houses to drive outside to get to. The gym floor shines so perfectly. I bet the owner must have about 40 slaves he orders to get down on their knees and hand wax it every night and buff it every morning. I laughed picturing that. This the type of gym every hood needed, where niggas could run a full court and the bitches could watch and cheer them on and eventually call dibs on the players they like. I know some chicks would like to run a game and handle and dribble the ball themselves. Not me. I remember Brooklyn's infamous Hustlers League and even the Harlem Rucker. I lived for that excitement. I loved the fashion show that framed it. I liked that crowd that poured in from every direction and even flooded down the block and caused the cops to shut down the traffic in the surrounding streets to watch the best ballers ball, showcasing amazing moves and skills. I lusted the whips that had pulled up close and parked and doubled and triple parked, creating a show within a show. Bitches all done up so nice, the best players played even harder. I looked up. Seven flags were hanging from seven metal poles lodged in the walls close to the high ceiling. I only recognized the American flag. It was number six in the flag lineup. I was glad to see it. I had been starting to think I was somewhere unfamiliar and too far away from where I am from. The sound of hydraulics and the back door of the gym slid open. A bunch of bareback young men walked in barefooted, wearing boot-cut black pants. Bare feet were starting to feel like the theme of this place, but I still wasn't with it. Line up, take your spaces. What I am with, though, is the 21 to, I'm guessing, possibly 23 years young, deep, black-skinned, fine-ass nigga leading the pack. I don't know what they're about to do. Not one of them has a basketball in their grip or kicks. The blackest one, who I have both my eyes on, positioned himself at the forefront of the rest. He called out the orders as he faced the other lined up teen young to maybe age 20 dudes. His eyes are serious. Not the eyes of some sheltered palace dweller or suburban sweetie. He's muscular but lean. His jaw is etched and sketched. His teeth are as white as the sparkling wall that surrounds this palace. His haircut is sharp and clean. Man, I'm feeling him. I know he's too young for me, but he is not a child. He is a man. And I know the trend is now for these young niggas to prefer slightly older women who are still more beautiful, more refined, more sensual in the sheets and more independent than the young bitches who ain't figured out their power the way I figured out mine at 16. And I can still pull a dick. I know that. And to this day, no nigga can tell my true age unless I decide to tell him. I won't. We all know what this is, the leader said. His voice so, ooh. It made my pussy pause. Whoever wins the fight competition gets to fight the fight master tonight. I doubt y'all could take him down. I've tried a few times. Everyone laughed. It hasn't worked out for me, but I'm confident that I can take down every one of you. Ah, yeah, right. Whatever, man. The young men on the lineup roared. I like that, the leader said in response. And when he smiled, he had me so open. Men are supposed to be trained and confident, sure and solid. Now let's see if you can back up all that back talk. Give me two lines of ten, partner up. After this spar, the last man standing will fight me. He said it like a threatening invitation and challenge. He spoke so confidently, I'm sure it convinced the other guys that they had had no chance of beating him. Ansar, I'm hoping you're the last man standing. Heard you have designs on my girl, the leader said, jaw locked and straight faced. Whoa, the man sounded and then went silent. She's not yours until you marry her, the one who must have been answered replied. And since you're moving too slow and no one can touch her before marriage, I'll take her from you and marry her so I can touch her. He said it like he meant his words. Let's skip the sparring and bang it out right now the leader said, and rushed right into the ranks to face Ansar. The other 19 men broke the line up and swiftly closed in and began circling around the 21 years young leader and Ansar. The moving circle was blocking me from seeing, but
but I could hear the blows and the woes and oaths and the advice being called out by the crowd. They were fighting with their hands and feet, I realized. Not a Brooklyn confrontation that ends in one second with no muscle involved, just the strength to pull the trigger and the eye to hit the target. The imperfect circle was spread out as the men would step back, sideways or forward, however the action moved them. I don't know who the bitch was they were fighting over, but I felt a strong feeling like I want niggas to fight over me just like that. I want to see muscles moving and fists swinging and bodies dropping over me. I miss that effect that a woman like me always caused many men to have. All of a sudden, I wanted a mirror more than anything. I want to see myself and check my hair. I'd position it properly over the scar and perfect my look. I need to confirm exactly what I look like right now. I want to check every inch of my body as well. I want to recapture that baddest bitch mojo and come back with full and pull that leader for myself for a trice. He don't have to marry me to give me that good feeling that I'm sure he and I both want to feel. We don't have to waste any time. And time is not what I have going in my favor. I dashed to the side room that I figured was the restroom for the gym. Once inside, I could see that it was for men with seven urinals and one long horizontal cement sink with seven silver faucets, soap dispensers, paper hand towels, and an automatic hand dryer. Three stalls for taking a dump and three stalls for taking a shower. A steam room and a sauna, but no mirrors. Angry, I dashed through the men's room wall and ended up in another yard filled with white roses facing a separate house a short distance away with a gold door. A gold door, I repeated in my mind as I walked. God damn. How much is the owner worth that a property could be built with multiple buildings secured behind a great wall made from a mountain? Doors all made from precious metals and rare materials as expensive as the buildings and beautiful outdoor spaces, pavilions, and furnishings. I got the feeling that here there was no regard for budget whatsoever. Close up on the door now, I quickly dropped down. On the right side, I saw a computer or flat TV screen. I was sure that the owner could see me through that security screen. I didn't want anybody to see me before I could fully see myself. Squatted low and facing my own toes, I was relieved that I still had the pretty pedicure that I allowed one of my girls on lockup, who was the meanest in that toe art, to design the night before my release. I ran my fingers over my feet, surprised that I didn't track in any soil or grass from that long walk through the field. I was happy that my hands and feet looked top-notch still. I glanced to my right. In an alcove in the wall was a man's shoe rack, three levels high. Seven velvet lined slots on each row for seven pairs of shoes. Maximum capacity, 21. My eyeball zoomed into each slot, recognizing what only the Queen of Queens could recognize. Of course, because a broke bitch would never even know what she was looking at. A connoisseur of kicks. I saw on the two bottom rows sat side by side a collection that only wealth and fame could get hands on and feet in. The red and black Jordans band were autographed by Michael Jordan himself. That's big. The only kicks that could sit beside those were the autographed Kobe Bryant, Mike Zoom, Kobe White and Gold, Striped. Next in the lineup was LeBron James 8, South Beach. In the other velvet slots were men's black Gucci kicks, Prada high tops, and an assortment of Air Force Ones, some custom designed and unavailable at retail. I am impressed. Were all of at least 14 of the young men in the gym caked up? And these were their kicks? Were the remaining seven of the young guys broke bastards with no shoes? I laughed and had to say to myself, You got some nerve, you barefoot bitch. Or was the whole rack of 21 pairs of shoes all for the feet of the owner? Amazingly, in the top slot was a pair of Arbor C diamond studded shoes next to a pair of Louis Vuitton Richelieu's next to a pair of Balutis next to a pair of Isaiah's next to a pair of Tom Ford's. Tom Ford, he is my fashion designer hero. For the only years that matter, Ford was the creative director of Gucci. He made Gucci lingerie, clothes, eyewear, footwear, and accessories so fucking sexy, 
that any nigga or bitch anywhere in the world wearing Gucci from head to toe fucking slayed the scene, ruled the room, rocked the party, and shocked the streets. The Santiago's, we pulled a Gucci plenty of times. Our whole family Gucci'd out from under, inner, and outerwear and accessories. On those days and nights, we stole the light and walked above the heads of niggas who were on a budget and could only cop one Gucci piece, like a keychain, belt, wallet, or a money clip. While I was locked up, Tom Ford and his man Domenico De Sol left Gucci and opened up their own elite Tom Ford line of every fashionable thing imaginable. His designer handbags were proof of his fashion supremacy. On lock when I saw them in my mags, I thought they killed the Birkin, even though Birkin was trending. Real fashionistas recognize real. When Ford and Domenico left Gucci, they took the stitch and the style, the sense and the allure, the quality and the reign over all with them. In fact, when they left, it was the same as when Princess Diana left the boring-ass royal family or the same as when Santiago left the streets he ruled. Or like when Notorious B.I.G. left music. Or like when Jordan and Allen Iverson and even Dennis Rodman left the court. The game just wasn't the same no more. That thing is something that can't be bought or sold. You either got it or you don't. Hell, that thing can't even be stolen. How a bitch like Simone like the apples? Oh, fuck. Don't think about her. I don't want to get angry and disappear. The point is, even if some new him or her or this or that arrives on the scene and tries to step in the shoes of the ones who got that thing in their blood, body, or look, in their profession, talent, or skill, in their hands, feet, or voice, or in their sports music, or whatever, the newcomer, even if he or she or it is a great imitator or knockoff, can never, ever reproduce the same level of feeling or sound, movement or hustle, fashion or flow or perfection. I felt a little sad for like six seconds squatting there at the golden door. Snap out of it. I reminded myself, a mirror, and I glanced to my left. In the left alcove, I saw a $6,000 pair of Jimmy Choo's Avril Crystal shoes sitting on top of a shoe rack packed with designer women's footwear. I stared. The crystals sparkled even though they were not in the sunlight. However, my fashion eyes were redesigning them, flooding each shoe with princess cut authentic diamonds tightly and properly placed, leaving no opening to see the shoe fabric. And on the back that hugs the ankle, six small emeralds. That would have been even more fuck the worldish. I laughed. I'm a dead bitch redesigning a pair of $6,000 shoes into a pair of $666,000 shoes. Not funny. I picked up the pair of crystal flooded Jimmy Choo shoes. I stood up and placed them onto my pretty feet. At first they didn't fit. Suddenly they did. I must have wanted these pretty bad, I thought to myself. Before, I couldn't grasp anything into my hand, not paper or envelopes or even water. I pranced through the left side of the sealed shut, solid gold at minimum, plated door without knocking, ringing, or activating the security screen or alarms. I walked through same as if the pure gold door was made of nothing but air. A circular scene was what I was seeing now. Sexy curved walls instead of flat and straight lines, boxes, squares, and rectangles. It was all quarter circles, semicircles, ovals, and even walls that seemed to swerve. I was blown away by it. There was no drywall, plywood, wood, or paneling in this palace, or even the other buildings that seemed to be all part of one to fight or die for empire. Even the clay potted flower and plant shelves as well as sitting spaces were indentations carved into the wall so sturdy and solid, I imagine they could withstand a bulldozer. Whoever's place this is, they're in love with the sky. They must have told the architect no ceilings, just domes and clear, not stained glass, so they could watch the sun rise and set or the moonlight pouring down stars. I was so fucking impressed. I searched for family photos and paintings. I could tell this circular building was lived in. Everything about it screamed occupied, even though it was cleaner than the Board of Health. 
Instead of pictures, the walls were covered with tiny pastel colored ceramic pieces so perfectly placed that even when the walls curved, the pattern of the towels and flow of the art didn't break. It was so precise. It was kind of crazy, I thought. This property existed behind a 15-foot high, white solid rock wall, but on the inside of the buildings, there were no walls separating one room from another like we are accustomed to having in our houses and mansions. In this circle, the kitchen was at the center of the huge wide space. It was so doped off that it could have been mistaken for a, a what? Fact is, I didn't have shit to compare what I was seeing to. The dangling utensils and steel pots and pans were outdone by the immaculate collection of tiny to massive all glass pots on the stove top. There was even a glass frying pan. I had never seen cookware like this before. One refrigerator, freezer, was as wide as three family refrigerator freezers. Two stoves and ovens, a total of ten burners, a flat griddle for pancakes and a waffle iron for waffles, and blenders and cappuccino machines and graters, slicers, choppers, and toasters, and even a deep fryer, a dough mixer, pasta maker, and an old school popcorn machine with the butter being designed like the one in your favorite movie theater. Ceramic dishes and deep bowls and water and juice gourds and deep well-decorated ceramic soup spoons. How many servants did they have? How was a lived-in space so perfectly clean? I started to doubt my own eyes, was searching for crumbs or dust or something spilled, even a droplet of water. Found nothing. Figured I was just bugging and reminded myself, the mirror, the mirror, the mirror, which led me to walk down the corridor in my crystal pumps that I wore like they were stilettos. I got startled when I had almost reached the next door, which I was sure had to lead to some bedrooms that had to have walls and privacy, bathrooms and showers, and yes, mirrors. A beautiful, all-black, green-eyed cat stepped out of one of the indentations in the wall. It looked at me like it was a person seeing another person. I'm not a pet lover, though. I never had any intention of picking up anything's poop or of living with animals like we family. I'm from the projects. We see roaches, we smash them. We hang sticky paper so all flies get stuck to it. Their legs pulled off until they die. If we even think for one second there's a mouse in the house, we trap it, snap off its tail, and trash it when it's finally dead. Let my project building maintenance man think there are some rats. He gets the whole cleanup crew to spread out the pink poison in the dirt. Then they rope it off. Put up the tape so kids don't play in it, like a murder scene. So I didn't stoop to pet the pretty creature, but I did see its diamond collar, and that made me pause and take a closer look. When I still didn't pet it, and instead of walked off, it followed me. I wanted it to go away. Cat looked sneaky, like it knew stuff a cat shouldn't know, or like a detective that would watch me too closely and then report back to some higher-up cat authority that would come trying to do me something a ferocious den of lions, where the Lion King held his throne. When I finally reached the door, I forgot the cat that was still there paused at my feet. The door was made of pure pearls. My eyes widened and my lips parted. I'm not the type that would ever buy a string of pearls or get all excited if a nigga bought it for me either, but I felt enticed by the designer's mind that thought to make a door made of pearls. I reached up to feel the surface, wanted to press my body up against it, but instead I passed through it, same as I had passed through the other incredibly precious doors. So as I did, I was whisked away, fast forwarding for what felt like only five seconds, but moving at a speed that prevented me from seeing what was on the way. When I stopped whizzing, I no longer had any vision. I was angry about it, felt cheated, I knew I was just about to find a mirror, a big one. People who cared about their look more than mostly they cared about anything had to have mirrors. People of wealth all worked hard at at least one thing, image. So they have to check and recheck and be certain before they allow anybody to see even one small detail out of sync. This is the kind of sensational property that I'd rather lose my hearing in if I had to choose and lose something but definitely not my eyesight.
Kush, what are you doing in here? I heard a woman's voice say. Who was she talking to? Then I heard the cat purr. She must have been stroking it. How did the cat arrive the same time as me? Was it whizzing through space like I was? She, there's only one wild cat allowed in this bedroom, and it's not Kush. I heard a man's hypnotic voice say. He sounded real familiar. Kush knows she's not allowed up here. This is the first time this has happened. One of our daughters may have left the door open by mistake. The female's voice said, she must be Chi. I'll let her out, but I think she has a crush on you. Look at how she stares into your eyes, Chi said. Oh, now even the cat has a crush on me, the male said smoothly, without laughter. You know I know every time a woman is attracted to you. I've always been right. Have I ever been wrong? She asked playfully. The cat purred, the sound much higher and closer to my ear, so I knew she must be holding the cat in her arms. I heard her walk away. I wanted the male voice to say something so I could be sure. But with Chi, whoever that is, gone from the room, he wasn't talking no more. I could only hear the rustle of his clothes, an expensive business dress shirt, I figured. Then I heard a slight clink. Cufflinks. I imagined he removed his and laid them on his glass top dresser drawer or night table. Next, I heard one jingle, his belt buckle, I believed. Then I heard his zipper. Oh, hell yeah. Soon, I heard the sound of him removing his pants and then his boxers. He must have felt good being undressed. I could hear the rhythm of his breathing change and his breath escaping like being naked was more comfortable. I stood still listening to the sound of his breathing. Then I heard the sound of his feet on what sounded like a marble, uncarpeted floor. A shower switched on. Yes, let's shower together, I thought to myself and felt even more excited. I heard the sound of a door closing. It was a glass shower. Of course it was. There would never be a cheap hole and shower curtain in a palace bathroom. And I could tell it was not the sound of the bathroom door shutting because the volume of the sound of the downpour of the water didn't decrease much at all. I threw off my Jimmy Choo's crystal heels like they were payless. I wiggled out of my Chanel mini inch by inch. It was tapered so lovely that it was like a second skin. There was no room to remove it, as though Coco wanted a bitch rich enough to afford it and bad enough to afford it and bad enough to wear it right to die with it on. When I was finally able to shed it, I tossed it who knows where. I'm not wearing a bra, panties, or a G-string. I like my titties free and my pussy raw. Now I am naked and tiptoeing into the bathroom, guided by the sound of the water and the warmth of the stream of the steam. I figured, hey, since I was able to pick up the heels and properly use my fingers, it meant that now I can even hold his balls in my hand, feel the ridges of his dick, the depth, the width, the texture. I started feeling around like Helen Keller, blind but determined to get to the shower glass door and inside, body to body. Ooh, I'm in. I can't feel the warm water, though. Am I really in? Did I open the linen closet and walk in there by mistake instead? I'm getting pissed at my missus and at my circumstances. I move around. Still can't tell if I'm in the shower or not. Then I smell a new scent, like flowers or some gourmet fresh-baked dessert or an expensive perfume. Something extremely alluring. Then I hear the shower door close. Did he get out? No, that would be too quick, I thought. But maybe I had again lost track of time and how to count it. I was sure of one thing, though. I could now hear two people breathing. One of them was not me. I could hear lips locking and tongue sliding. I could hear wet, sudsy skin rubbing against skin. Oh. 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 Her breathing was accelerating. Soon, she was moaning softly. Then suddenly, she screamed pure pleasure like a celebration. He started talking some sexy shit to her. I could tell by his tone. 
but he was speaking in some other language that I have either never heard or never noticed. She replied in the same other language. It was all soft, sexy talk while the intensity of the downpour of the water was the soundtrack to it. I'm trying to control my anger. Wished I could find and snatch the shower head and turn the temperature of the water to freeze. Spray that bitch and cause her to flee. Speak English like you two motherfuckers were speaking it five minutes ago, I screamed. My scream was not like her moan or her scream, though. Hers was on some ecstasy level. You know what mine was. Eventually, the shower water went from heavy downpour to a trickle. The door closing sound happened. They were out of the shower now. I could just feel it, but they were still in the bathroom area. I could feel that too. It was obviously a large space. Duh, what else would it be? I should have been calling it a spa. To name it a bathroom sounded like a cheap insult. I heard the rustle of a towel. Then a top was being opened and the tube being squeezed or something like that. That feels so good she said put your hands up he said am i under arrest she replied so softly that you knew her ass wasn't under no fucking arrest niggas getting arrested either don't say shit or say something foul your turn she said on some sexy shit they were kissing again i was ready to leave i like it better when you do it for me she said softly I could hear their bodies moving, but not leaving the bathroom area. It dawned on me that it didn't matter that I was ready to leave. A dead bitch doesn't control the action. I don't even know where I am or who I'm with. Picture a grown-ass Brooklyn bitch who don't know even that. Draw the curtains, I heard him say. The sound of their voices and bodies was back in their bedroom. Why? No one can see in. She paused. Then I could hear the curtain fabric dropping down. I always thought that's the reason we have no neighbors, she laughed. I don't even want the birds peeping at my wife, he said calmly. Impossible, she said excitedly. Impossible what? He asked coolly. Impossible that you could still love me that much, she teased, then added. After I have given birth to seven of your sons and two of your daughters. What fool would not love a woman even more than he loved her before after she pushed out nine of his children? He asked her and he sounded serious, but she was still playing. Um, let me see, she laughed. Maybe a guy who has three other wives, two of them younger than me, one from Sudan, one from Oman. Then there's the first wife from Korea, she teased. Come here, he said to her, and the sound of the way he said it turned my rising anger to intense desire as though he was saying, come here to me. And one from Japan, he said and kissed her. I'm feeling burnt. Who flies freely in and out of all of those countries and follows me all around the world wherever I go, he said. I do not, she laughed, and I definitely knew she was lying. Who follows me even when she's seven months pregnant, no matter how far I go? A girl so pretty, smart, loyal, loving, helpful that I built her a private palace, a queendom. And I put it right here in the UAE, a perfect peaceful place. Made it of everything precious to show her how precious she is to me. But the pretty pilot won't stay put in her palace unless I am right here beside her. So now, to please my second wife, the pilot, the wildcat, I moved all of my wives and all of our children and even my friends and their wives and children to where she is so I could be right by her side. My vision clicked on. I thought it was cruel. She had her naked body pressed against his body. Her hands clasped at the back of his neck. I walked up behind him and pressed my body against his back. I put my hands on each side of his waist and tried to pull him away from her and onto me. True, she said softly. I could tell she was about to re-seduce him. And she said playfully, then kissed him. 
After you do that thing for me one more time, she giggled. We can talk about how two of our sons are about to fight over the Santiago daughter. Santiago daughter? That's me, I thought. I ran around to face him, and over her shoulder, I could see clearly what I had already sensed and known. I tried to swipe her out of his grasp, but my hands had no impact. I tried to yank her long black braid, choke her with it. My hands couldn't clasp it. Hey, what are my heels doing up here? I left them outside on the rack, she asked softly. I couldn't tolerate any more. I screamed at the top of my lungs, Midnight! 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 But obviously, he couldn't hear, feel, or see me. It didn't matter anymore. I overheated and instantly, I dissolved. Furious on several levels, I was back to being a ball of heat. The bitch he had was perfect. She knew it. He knew it. I knew it. She was golden skinned, my same complexion, around my same height. Her hair was black and long. She wore it in one thick braid down the center of her head. It was real, not purchased, same as mine. Her silver gray eyes gave her the advantage. They looked stunning like the sterling silver door lit up by the sun. And I could tell she had him hypnotized. Like me, she had the diamond cut body, unbelievably tight and lean, especially after pushing out seven boys and two girls. A pilot. Well, what the fuck? Who's going to beat a bitch in a jet or better yet a helicopter? Men like foreign cars and like foreign bitches even more. I hated that. Four wives? And they all cool with that? They're fucking up the game. What am I supposed to be? Wife number five? Picture that. Never, ever, ever. I had thought that after my victorious prison release, emerging out of snitch-free, time-served, real million-dollar bitch, which even though Midnight wasn't scheduled to be there, he would without a doubt be watching me on his widescreen TV. Then I can get rid of his wife. Not kill her, of course. Just replace her because I'm obviously the better choice. How am I supposed to dispose of four bitches? Who come to find out are all from separate faraway places that nobody ever heard of, been to, and where nobody would ever want to go? What the fuck is Oman, Sudan, UAE? UAE? I was trying to figure that out the whole time we were all three in his bedroom. He said that's where we were standing in the palace he built for Chi. What is UAE? Is it United African Empire? Ah, uh, hell no. When I was whizzing through the darkness, it was a longer journey than the other two times it had happened to me. But it wasn't long enough to have traveled all the way to the African jungle. And when I arrived, there was no safari. And I didn't see no broken down huts or bald-headed ashy babies with flies chilling on their noses. Their fingers so weak from starvation that they couldn't even swat them away. I didn't see no braless pygmies lined up to get one bowl of cereal from some foreigner scooping it out of a metal trash bin because they pitied them. So that's that. It definitely wasn't Africa. Yeah, I heard of Korea before because they the ones who owned a lot of markets in Brooklyn and who shined up the fruit and stacked it in neat rows before any other grocer started doing it that way. They were the originators or champions of the open 24 hours salad bar. They was also the ones who was quick to say something slick to a nigga shopping in their store and set off a whole heated situation. Of course everybody in the whole world heard of Japan. The Japanese got sushi. Any real top bitch has not only heard of it, she's been served it and has tasted it. Plus the high end Japanese restaurants flaunted wicked architecture. Even their interior designs was doped off with separate grill stations at each customer's table and a personal Japanese chef doing a knife show as he prepared steaks and shrimp and shit like that. However, she definitely didn't sound like a Japanese bitch. She didn't look like any Japanese bitch I ever seen while chilling at Benihana. She was above them. See what I'm saying? And once those foreign bitches who got our same look start speaking in different languages 
showing the fuck off? How a hood bitch gonna keep up? How she gonna shine? I was cool hugging his back. I had somehow blotted her out. I just wanted to get my moment, my feel, have my way with him without him being able to resist. I had always wanted to suck his collarbone since I was 13, press my nude body up against his, trace my prettiest finger lightly over his incredible jawline, hold his face in my hands and feel the pleasure of his thick lips. More than that, he was the only man worthy of me marrying him and whose children I ever wanted to push out and keep and say, these are his and my babies. Babies who were not a burden, but a treasure. But when I looked up while hugging him, her hands were dangling there on the backside of his neck. I could see her unusually precious pear-shaped diamond wedding ring. That sent me over the edge. It was the same as if she had stolen my life, was wearing my jewels, was living in my palace, was the mother of my sons, and was loving my men, and apparently he was loving her back even more. Of course he was. They were both standing there glistening from the oil I'm sure he had massaged onto her skin. Her wet, silky, fresh braided long black braid that after I put two and two together and from what I had just overheard had been braided by him. That infuriated me. But when she asked about her shoes, the Jimmy Choo's crystal pumps, I felt stabbed. With one simple question, she had highlighted for me that, hey, she's right. This all her shit, not mine. The silver, pearls, platinum, palaces, gold, and diamonds were all hers. Worth more than all those precious jewels was the man she had wrapped around her finger. How am I supposed to deal with that? It was as though she had hit the local number, the lotto, and the mega. My mind switched when she said, our sons are about to fight over the Santiago daughter. At first I thought, yeah, that's me. Then I sobered up and figured out what should have been pretty clear. Midnight had adopted my twin sisters, Lexi and Mercedes, when Santiago got locked down. So one of them girls had caught the hearts of two of Midnight's many sons. That's stepbrothers in love with their stepsisters. I don't believe in step anything. Only real blood relations matter. And the fact of the matter is Lexi and Mercedes don't share one drop of the same blood with Midnight's real children. So Midnight's sons were fair game for them. Since Santiago's daughters all know a real man when we see one, because we are the daughters of the realest man, of course one of them or maybe even both of them peeped that that 21 years young leader of their bareback young men in the palace gym was pure fire. Undoubtedly worth scratching the next bitch eyes out over or even putting a knife in her ribs. Who else could the young leader have been other than the son of Midnight, the king of men? Wait a minute. My math mind was merging with the memory. When I was 17 years young, I definitely had asked Midnight if he had any children. He told me no. Why did he lie to me? He couldn't have a 21-year-old son now if he was not already born when I first asked him at age 17. Maybe I'm wrong with the number 21 that I guessed from what my eyes saw was the young leader's age. Now I felt greasy for wanting to jump on his son's dick, but not too greasy because I didn't know. And I did 15 on lockup. I'm allowed to feel a little anxious. But why were Midnight's two sons fighting over one twin? They each could have had one to themselves. Hey, my twin sisters both look the same, or maybe not anymore. Maybe one of them had gotten fat or sloppy. I doubt it, though. Maybe one of them was extreme fashion and several cuts above the other. Maybe one of them had become an undesirable bookworm. But the fact that she was even the mother over my twin sisters, and she had all of the answers and info about them that I didn't know, and she had raised and seen them while I was locked in the cage, was another knife. This time, through my throat. Experts of art, fashion, and design, like myself, have eyes that are swift to see, survey, and size up the look, the authenticity, and value of all. 
Of course, I had seen through the sheer white ceiling to floor curtains that were pretty but not powerful enough to block the sun. I saw their doped-off backyard replete with everything that hood niggas and average everybody else has to go to the park to enjoy with a million other strange motherfuckers doing the same. Aside from the swings and the seesaws, the outdoor brick oven, kitchen, and the barbecue pit was to cry for. The collection of off-road vehicles, motorcycles, and exotic whips were lined up in the distance as well. That choked me, strangled me. To think that my father Santiago was locked up in the box in an 8 by 5 cell with no way out while this man, who he put on, was wearing his crown, fathering his daughters, living his lifestyle, and then some, was way too much. I even got more heated because I did not know how everything went down between Santiago and Midnight exactly. Santiago didn't say in his letters, I'm not stupid, so of course I know Papa couldn't say it in writing and also couldn't say it to my face because we were both prisoners serving time. I do know that Papa still trusts Midnight and that Midnight still looks out for him. That meant that Midnight never flipped on Santiago. Papa was swift with his revenge over anyone who did. Even from behind bars, Papa, he could make that type of shit happen. Still, I couldn't figure. Why was Midnight, who I saw back when I was 17 years young, on the exact day he left New York, to move down to Maryland, rich. No, not rich, filthy rich. When on the day he left, all he had was his one suitcase in the back seat of his black Acura, which I saw with my own eyes. Seeing him and Cheese monopoly over everything and everyone, his wealth, women, property, possessions in great detail was suffocating me. Now, was I supposed to hate him? I already loved him. The fact that he landed on his feet and blew the fuck up like a real motherfucking hustler made me love him even more. The real headbanger that happened in that master bedroom was when I realized that there had been mirrors in the palace, placed in the usual spots where mirrors belong. I had even looked into those mirrors one by one. It wasn't until the end when I saw Cheese vanity table, packed with perfumes and oils, lotions and creams, then looked up and saw Midnight and her in front of me, and looked back and saw them behind me. Then I realized that I was staring into a mirror, but a dead bitch ain't got no reflection. <laughs>